Good morning, folks. We apologize for the, uh, the delay of getting started this morning. Uh, as always, it seems to be uh, challenges uh, living in this new world that we have. Uh, we're happy to be with you here. C'est notre première town hall depuis le mois de mars. Il y avait beaucoup de changements qui, depuis ce temps-là. Le niveau de COVID dans la province a bien augmenté. La province euh, et la base ont mis en vigueur des nouveaux restrictions. On est en et on a entamé un programme de vaccination. Et depuis le début du programme, presque 90% de la population de l'ESCAD a leur chance de recevoir leur première dose. Et hier, on a commencé à administrer les deuxièmes doses afin de compléter le programme avant la fin du juin. So with, without a doubt, COVID has had a resurgence here in Nova Scotia. Cases have climbed rapidly since the end of April. Uh, we reached a uh, peak in early May, and now we are starting to come down. But we are far from being out of the woods. The restrictions the province has put in place for movements and activities will remain in place until at least the 9th of June, based on the latest provincial announcement. But they could yet be extended if we don't get this third wave under control. 14 Wing has certainly not been unaffected by this third wave. We've had our share of personnel hearing that they could be exposed to COVID and requiring isolation and testing to locate and contain cases. Even our mess has had a brush with COVID-19 a few weeks back, as I spoke to you about uh, uh, through uh, the PA and through Microsoft Teams. But despite the numerous brushes with COVID, I'm proud to say that 14 Wing continues to do very well. We've had a a small share of cases of, of the we've had a very small share of the cases in the province but such a low number that it's safe to say we have been much less impacted than it could have been this is in large part to the due diligence of 14 wing in maintaining the public health measures supporting each other and following the direction to isolate and test when need be with all those efforts i want to highlight a few key statistics that come out of it the number of cases here at 14 wing that are attributed to military travel that's despite our deployments to Japan, El Salvador, the Middle East, Iceland, the UK, and many other domestic locations, the number of cases is zero. The number of cases that we've transmitted from one member to another here in the workplace is zero. The number of cases that we have transmitted from a military member to someone in the community, that's someone outside their immediate household, is zero. And the number of military personnel who have received their first dose here at 14 Wing is now stands at 1,520 people. That's 87% of our Wing's military population with only about 6% left of our population to get into the clinic for their first dose, which will happen next week. And the number of military personnel who've now received their second dose is over 100 people now. And every single clinic we hold from here on in, our members will be getting their second dose meaning that two weeks after that second dose, they can expect to have between 90 to 95% protection against COVID. So these are numbers I'm proud of, but ones that I don't think that anyone in the, that listening here today, or that even I will hang my hat on. They prove that we can do the essential business of defense here at 14 Wing, and we can do it safely within our workplace. And they can do it, and that'll only happen though, if we continue to put service before self, and take the proper steps to protect ourselves, our co-workers, our families, and our friends, and our community. We have achieved all of this while doing that essential business of defense that's so important. Search and rescue operations have continued, and in fact, even this week, SAR crews are in a training surge right now to get ready for what will be a busy summer season, no doubt. Long-range patrol operations have continued in deployed operations that I've already spoke to, but most, most recently in El Salvador for Op Carib, and now also in the Middle East with Op Artemis, with the crews just coming back. In both cases, we supported our allies, it showed the strength of a coalition against illegal uh, transnational crime and terrorism. 404 Squadron has continued with technician and air crew training at a rate that we have not seen before. Indeed, we've had more students in-house this year than we've had in many, many years prior. The CP-140 periodic maintenance line continues. Work is going on that is really crucial to keeping uh, those aircraft available for the first line. And on, and on top of that, 14 AMS has taken on additional projects, 
such as working on engine upgrades, propeller upgrades, electronic prop controllers, and additional projects to add uh, avionics packages to the airframe. We've had Block 4 testing and production continuing. We've achieved a major milestone on Block 4. Namely, we've got the completion of flight characterization. Uh, the flight test characterization has been done, and we have also worked through ground proof of compliance. We're now working on flight proof of compliance testing, SATCOM system certification, and shortly we'll move into the first phase of operational test and evaluation, which will pave the way for the use of these aircraft in domestic operations, at least initially. In fact, you'll even start to see these aircraft fly here at 14 Wing doing pilot proficiency flights in the not too distant future. All of this has been supported by the very important work of 14 OSS, 14 MSS, and the Deputy Wing Commander Branch, who have all had to plow through all the critical year end work that has to be done in order to keep this base functioning, providing a level of service to all the operational uh, flying elements. And they've had to do that while while working through a COVID lockdown, just like everyone else. So we have accomplished a lot since March, and I am tremendously proud of all the efforts and everything that you've done. And I thank you and your families for your sacrifice and your service, service of the recent months. I, I know it has been tough. We have many more challenges ahead of us though, and many of which we're gonna talk about today, but we will meet and overcome every challenge if we continue to embrace our model to op as operate as one. Chief. Well, good morning, everyone. Chief Warnasher Campbell here. Uh, I won't speak too long in the introduction. Today is my last town hall as the 14 wing chief warrant officer, and I'll be talking a little bit about, about that and give my thanks to a lot of people towards the end of the town hall. Uh, you know, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm extremely proud as well of all the work that's been done over the wing, and I'll get more into that later on. I was treated to a, a nice treat this morning uh, that really reflects to me the importance of, of a relationship and, and what we do in the Canadian Armed Forces by, by serving alongside of each other. So as I was pulling into the parking lot this morning, I had a, a gentleman pull up behind me. I thought he was lost and looking for directions. And it turned out to be the first chief warrant officer that I ever had in my military career from 416 Squadron in Cold Lake uh, many years ago. So chief warrant officer retired Al Gray, uh, you know, who I was in his office at least one time and, uh, to be in trouble, <laughs> scared out of my mind. And uh, you know, so it was great to see him this morning. He was heading off uh, off to play some golf, and so I could see my future down the line at maybe doing that someday as well, just like him. So, but that's uh, that's a really great thing. So keep that in mind when you're working alongside of each other that you are impacting each other and you're doing great things. So, you want to talk about the protocol that we're going to be doing today? Yeah, that sounds good, Chief. So, aujourd'hui, la grande majorité de cet événement sera fait en anglais. Et comme d'habitude, ça va être notre plaisir de prendre des questions et répondre en français ou en anglais selon votre préférence. You can write your questions into in as a comment. We have people that are just standing here off screen. Uh, you'll hear them madly tapping away. They'll transcribe those questions onto paper, pass them into us, and we'll start answering them. And uh, the, we'll do the very best we can provide on the answers we have right now. And if we have to go and do some more research, we'll be sure to do that and then get you an answer just as soon as we can. And while we wait, we know that some questions have already come in in advance of this meeting. And while we wait for other ones to come in, uh, we want to get back, get, get into doing uh, a few awards. So a few months back, the Wing Chief Warrant Officer and I were discussing some of the great things that were going on here at 19 Wing. Uh, we, we've handed out many commendations, whether they be Wing Commander commendations, Command commendations, uh, right way up to CDF commendations. There's been medals and coins that have been handed out. But it was clear to me that one thing the Wing had not done in a while as it was handed out some annual leadership awards, which were a fixture when I was a, a younger captain and major here at 14 Wing. Uh, so uh, we both decided that this was something we, we didn't want to let fall by the wayside any longer. And so uh, we both agreed that it was long past time to get on with, with, with restarting these awards and rebranding them. And when we were relaunching them, we wanted them to be something meaningful. We just didn't want to dust off an old trophy and bring it out. We wanted something that could help tie what it is you're doing here at 14 Wing today to the history of all the people that have gone before that have actually made great contributions to this uh, to this wing, to the RCAF. And, and so for all the military leadership awards, we wanted to actually name them uh, after a fallen comrade who has made a significant contribution to the Canadian Armed Forces. And so we've done that. And so uh, we had to research each award. We had to reach out to their families uh, to receive their permission to use the name on the awards. And uh, we had an agreement to have them here with us 
but unfortunately COVID uh, put the kibosh on that. So we hope at some future time to be able to invite the families in, uh, in the future times that we award these, uh, and we look to have that connection build over time. Uh, their loved one's name has been donated to this wing, in effect, in order for us to, to rebrand these leadership awards. And I'm very thankful to all of those who, who agreed to allow us to do that. So um, as we go through and hand out these awards, we'll kind of preface uh, what is the motivation of the history of why we chose the, the individual's name for this award. And so with that, what we'll do is uh, we're going to do a little bit of a shuffle here. I'm going to stand up and move off screen. But we'll have the chief's going to take my spot and we'll call forward one of our first uh, recipients. So I'll read first uh, the, uh, the Junior NCM Leadership Award. It is the Aviator Jameson Award. Aviator Jameson was a member of 14 Construction Engineering Squadron in Pictou, Nova Scotia. He graduated from the Basic Military Qualification course in Aldershot, Nova Scotia, and received the Top Candidate Award at the course graduation ceremony. He expressed his desire to continually learn and to take on challenging and leadership roles in the RCAF. Sadly, his promising young career was tragically cut short by an automobile accident in Kingston, Ontario in August 2018. So I'll ask Corporal Bordash to come forward here. Sir. Although new to the 404 herd, Corporal Bordash has quickly stood out amongst his peers. Corporal Bordash's professionalism during the transition from technician to instructor of the next generation of ABS technicians is nothing short of outstanding. Corporal Bordash showed great initiative in creating the QL0 training plan. Knowing that 404 squadron's facilities were far better suited to deliver such training, he coordinated with, coordinated with members of the maintenance training flight and other, operational, and other Aurora squadrons to develop and deliver lessons in-house resulting in a highly effective framework for the QL04 generation. Corporal Bordash has consistently set a shining example of military decorum and leadership that makes him truly deserving of the Aviator Jamerson Junior NCM Leadership Award. And so we have the brand new trophy here at 14 Wing that will stay here in the headquarters and every single person who receives the award is getting a, a take home award. So congratulations. Thank you so much for all the work that you've done. Well deserved. Thank you, sir. Do you want to proceed with the next one there, Chief? Sure. Yeah, got to switch again. The next award is the Senior NCM Leadership Award. It is uh, the Master Warrant Officer Browning Senior NCM Leadership Award. Orville Clifford Browning enlisted in the Navy, actually in the Air Force, as an aviation technician at the age of 17 and proudly served his country at home and abroad for 43 years. Retiring at the rank of Master Warrant Officer, at the time of his retirement, he was the longest serving African Canadian member of the Canadian Armed Forces with three bars on his Canadian decoration. The last 13 years of his service was given to assisting in the training of and being a role model to our youth in the Royal Canadian Air Cadets. He sailed on both the HMCS Magnificent and Bonaventure, two of our last aircraft carriers, and he served in Egypt as a UN peacekeeper. Orville's military career consisted of posting to HMCS, later CFP Shearwater, and Greenwood, Nova Scotia in 1977. At the height of the Cold War, Warren Officer Browning was recognized by the Minister of National Defense for providing the name for the state-of-the-art long-range patrol aircraft. The name Orville had chosen for the aircraft to protect us from the threat of nuclear attack from the Soviet submarines was uniquely Canadian. It was called the Aurora. After retirement, Browning remained an active leader in his community, delivering meals and on wheels, and was a member of the Gibson Woods Baptist Church. I'll call on M.W. Lamar to come forward. Yes, sir. Sure. M.W. Lamar has demonstrated superior leadership, vision, and outstanding bravery as the 413 SARTEC star tech team leader. When MWO Lamoth first arrived at 413, there were systematic, systemic issues in the training system that had led to a shortfall of parachute, diving, and medical skills, made worse by numerous training waivers. To overcome this, MWO Lamoth mentored and empowered junior supervisors 
and very quickly rebuilt the leadership culture of the SAR section. In a matter of months, training waivers have been reduced from dozens to just three. Content self-isolation requirements from the pandemic cost the, sec cost the section eight of their 25 personnel strength at pretty much all times. To reduce the travel requirements for training, MWO Lamont developed innovative local training activities instead. Through superior administrative work, MWO Lamont also secured added funding for the SAR Tech section to rebuild better tools and equipment. Thanks to superior management, the 413 SAR section will emerge from the pandemic stronger and better prepared for the next challenge. Embodying the principle of leading from the front and the unit motto that others may live, MWO Lamont just this year has been directly responsible for saving 13 Canadian lives alongside his other, the other members of 413 squad. In one case, he safely extracted four crew members to the helicopter on minimum fuel at night as their vessel sank beneath them. On a later rescue, MWO Lamont saved another five crew members from a fishing boat that was found in exceptionally violent seas. For all these reasons, MWO Lamont is highly deserving of the MWO of the Master Warrant Officer Orville Browning Senior NCM Leadership Award. Thank you. Thanks, I'll shake it hands, eh? Oh, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> The next award that we'll be uh, presenting is the Colonel Herb Smale Officer Leadership Award. Colonel Smale was a prominent leader in the RCF and aviation community, commanding 407 Maritime Patrol Squadron, now the long range, now a long range patrol squadron, in Comox, BC from 1965 to 1968. He was promoted to Colonel in 1971 and appointed the base commander of CFP Greenwood. He had several noteworthy accomplishments through his career, but was most known as the founder of the P2000 Club in 1966, which is now known as VPI International with a building that stands just outside our main gate. Today, VPI International establishes an association of airmen to foster good and, and technicians to foster goodwill and fellowship among flyers of long range patrol aircraft through the promotion of understanding and recognition of operations and their impact on military aviation. The membership eligibility is based on aircrew having attained a minimum of 2000 flight hours on an LRP aircraft and it has become a worldwide associate. It has become a worldwide association with some 6,000 members serving and retired aircrew from 23 countries. Smail remained an active member of the community, and after his retirement in 1974, served as the president of Branch 112 Royal Canadian Legion in Lawrencetown, Nova Scotia. He continued to be involved in organizations including the Greenwood Flying Club, the RCAF Association, and in 1995, he was appointed the honorary colonel of 14 Wing Greenwood. Wing Choi Warrant Officer, would you mind uh, reading the citation? Yes, so this award is going to Captain McRae. Er, Captain McRae has shown superior leadership skill and exceptional judgment as a senior SAR navigator at 413 Squadron. As the Wing LC Officer, Captain McRae has engaged several fleet specific LC issues, working with all 14 Wing Squadrons to arrive at solutions. He has also applied strong technical skills to create customized programs to manage the unit's operations more effectively. Captain McRae is the Deputy Hercules Flight Commander, directing the various section heads on the Flight Commander's behalf. In addition to serving on crews as an operational SAR navigator, Captain McRae holds the Navigator Standards position, upholding critical standards functions for all 413 Squadron AXOs. As a senior instructor, he guides junior instructor candidates through their training, enabling subsequent generations to carry on operating the CC-130 Hercules. Earlier this year, Captain McRae faced a challenging situation on a training mission. Showing superb poise, he embodied the finest ethical values of the CAF through a calm demeanor and outstanding decision-making under pressure. Captain McRae brings leadership and maturity well above, well above that is expected of a captain to every situation and is most deserving of the Colonel Herb Smale Officer Leadership Award. Sir Captain McRae, I want to congratulate you and thank you for your service to the country this year. You've shown uh, an amazing amount of poise in some really tough situations, and you've been a great, doing a great job leading that next generation. We are constantly talking about how we have a challenge in building, building the next generation. We have an experience gap, and it's your efforts, efforts like just like you're doing, helping mentor and train that next generation, which is actually going to close that gap. And I thank you for your efforts this year. Thank you, sir. Okay, the uh, next award we're going to do 
now is uh, is to recognize that we are here a combined team. We're a combined team here at 14 Wing, and we always have not only military red force and reserve, but we also have an outstanding contributions every year from our civilian defense team members here at 14 Wing. And so we will present this year the 14 Wing Greenwood Civilian of the Year Award. We are rebranding it with a new trophy, and it'll be uh, presented every year to annually recognize a civilian defense team employee who has individually made the most significant and noteworthy contributions to the mission, reputation, and who embodies the motto, operate as one. And this year's civilian of the year is Samantha Ford. Despite only being in her current position for a year, Mrs. Ford has made significant contributions toward the betterment of 14 AMS, the wing and the local community. Recognizing inefficiency, she standardized e staffing procedures for a large squadron, led the implementation of Office 365, ensuring the squadron could function more efficiently with remote work. Her selfless attitude is exemplified through her numerous volunteering efforts in the local community. In her own time with a deployed spouse, Mrs. Ford was the choir director of the Queen of Heaven Chapel, coordinated all virtual mass services for the community, ensuring faith services continued in a COVID 19 environment, and executed a thorough Sunday a thorough Sunday school program for children in the community. She is extremely dedicated, innovative, hardworking, and truly deserving to be named Civilian of the Year. Samantha, uh, you're not one to like the spotlight, I know. And so I know I'm making you quite uncomfortable, but the honest truth is you've worked so hard and you've done so much for this wing that you deserve the spotlight. I know a lot of folks uh, in the community see you maintaining Facebook pages, instructing their kids, making them feel at home, and, and that amount of work, that leadership in the community, is just above and beyond what anybody could normally expect from somebody, and particularly doing all of that while your spouse was deployed for months without even knowing when they were coming back. Uh, that's a hard burden to bear. You, you bore it all the same, and thanks to you, there's a lot of people in this community that have been touched by your efforts and have felt better through COVID and felt more at home through COVID. And I can't thank you enough for everything you've done this year. Okay, Chief, if you want to dive back into frame, I guess we're going to get into uh, questions and answers now that we've uh, gone through the, uh, the award part. Take this mask off now. So um, we've, had, we've had a bunch of questions have come in before the town hall, so we'll get on to those right away. And I know our team is working on bringing out the other ones that will come up in due time here. So uh, one of the biggest questions that, that keeps coming is, uh, is restrictions and how to interpret the restrictions. And I know there's a lot of a, a lot of um, concern about making sure that you're doing the right thing to make sure that you're not going to run afoul of things. And you see what you what you see are differences in, in, in maybe direction that the wing has and what the province has. And you're trying to find a way to navigate through that. So I want to one of the big ones has been how to live with this situation where we have to stay within our municipality. And how is that? limitation different than what the wing has put in place, which is if you're going to leave our geographic area, you need a leave pass. So I'll try to explain that as best as I can. First of all, the message from the wing and the province is the same in the mo most general sense, is that we want you to stay at home as much as you can, unless you're coming to work or going out for essential activities. There's no difference between the province and the wing on that count. We do have to bring you in sometimes for the essential business of defense. There are some jobs here at 14 Wing which simply must get done because we have people deployed around, deploying around the world and things that have to be done in order to defend this nation. That is essential work. But outside of that, we want you to go home, stay home, and stay safe. Now, the province rule is you can't leave your municipality uh, when you're not going to work or doing essential business. That means that if you need to cross the border, of a municipality, but it's because you're going to get food or some essential business that you need to do for your family that is permitted. Uh, and so we've, tr we've decided to leave it just like that, that. That's what the provincial restriction is. Now, if you decide you've got you've got business that you consider essential, but might take you beyond the borders of the municipality, but even even farther, they might take you beyond the borders of the Greenwood, Greenwood geographic area. I've imposed a requirement to have a leave pass because I, in order to help protect you, to make sure you're making the best decision possible, I want a CO to oversee whether or not 
that is truly essential. And if there's any other way that we can help you achieve what it is you need to do without having to leave the area, that's a way of making sure that you're not transiting, going up to Halifax uh, for what you think is essential when there might be another method to get that done for you. And so we're trying to make sure that we, we, we pose that extra condition on that's over and above what the province is doing, but we're doing that to make sure that uh, we have some way of overseeing what's going on. But I could go more strict. I could make a leave pass if you're leaving municipality, but you don't want to have to apply for a leave pass to go shopping at Sobeys. I'm pretty sure. So that's why we're not doing that. So that's why there is a difference because I need, I need to trust you that if I give you the best information and I tell you to stay home and only go out if it's essential, that you, knowing what's best for this province, knowing that you have pride in uniform and that you always think of service before self, that you'll use your best judgment. And so that's why we're, there is this slight discrepancy, but it's there because we trust you. We trust you to think of what's best for your community. Now, Dan, we had some questions about uh, what are our expectations for parents at work? Uh, people that have kids at home, I know I'm in that situation. Uh, you want to yep. answer that question? Yes, for sure. So it, it's basically the same as it was the last time when we went through the second wave and the first wave. So all the all of the uh, the COs and the chiefs of every unit uh, have been told to remain flexible. So we understand there's going to be numerous challenges, especially with uh, with teaching and education or working from home uh, and teaching your children from home. So the orders are out there is that if you if you need to stay home because you have children of, uh, that are being schooled from home, then talk to your chain of command and they are to remain flexible and to allow for that. And I know that some units have done things where they've allowed people to get a laptop, get home and they're working in shifts one week on, one week off. I know others have done time shifting of their work where some people are working in the evenings and that way they can be home during the day. And in other cases, we're looking at whether or not the work just simply needs to be done at all. There's a, a whole range of different things. What I'm not doing as a wing commander, nor does the wing chief want to do this, is try to impose one model for all right across the wing, because the business of a search and rescue technician, of a search and rescue squadron, is completely different from wing telecom flight. It's completely different from a duty watch that happens at 14 OSS, and it's completely different from uh, a periodic maintenance line or a, the flying operations of 405 squadron. So I'm trusting your supervisors and your COs to make sure that they apply common sense and give you as much flexibility as they can. The other question we've had is a lot of bit of, has been a lot about vaccinations and people I talked about some of our numbers of vaccinations and, and one of the questions we have is what is the percentage of people that have refused vaccinate vaccinations and is it more or less than what we expected? So at this point, only about 5% of the people that have gone to the clinic have refused vaccinations and so we are doing quite well. In fact, we're doing better than the national average in some ways. But I wouldn't get focused in on this. I know a lot of people are really worried about whether the person beside them is vaccinated or not. And I'm going to ask you to just listen to me, hear me out here. And as I've said all along, vaccinations must be a personal choice. We're dealing with a person's own body here. And so you need to make a choice and it has to be based on informed consent. And that's what we're trying to do through our vaccination clinics to make sure that you have your the best information when you make your decision. I know I've gone, I'll, I'll freely tell you, I've had my first dose. You've, anyone who sees me on Facebook knows that I've got my dose. The chief got his second dose just yesterday. I'll get my second dose on Tuesday next week. And so I recommend that everybody gets it. Um, I, I know if you're at first hesitant and you've now changed your mind, that is okay. Don't think for a second that the door is not open for you to come get that vaccine now just because you've changed your mind. In fact, I encourage you to step forward. If you've, if you've changed your mind, come forward, identify yourself to your OPI and, and get that vaccine. You know, vaccines are only going to be fully effective when we have 90 to 95 percent, uh, will, will give us 90 to 95 percent protection when they're fully effective. That's about two weeks after that second dose. And so that gives the individual protection and it also reduces serious illness. And even now we're seeing the early data is showing that if you are, have two doses of vaccination uh, of the vaccine in you, that it also helps reduce the chance of transmission, even if you do become infected. And so while I can understand you might have concerns of working along somebody, somebody who is not vaccinated, but we have to respect everybody's right to choose. And I'll also just kind of point out that your many people are worried have that posed the question to me is that you're worried of being at risk because the person beside you might not be vaccinated, might bring COVID into work. That, that, that is a possibility, I won't deny it. But, you have a, but if you have both your doses, you'll be, have a 95% level of protection against COVID. In fact, 
you could still be a carrier of COVID, even if you had two doses of the vaccine, as I've just said, it looks like to me that it, it'll mostly stop that, but it's still a possibility, which means you could bring the vaccine, even if you're fully vaccinated, or the, the COVID, even if you're fully vaccinated into work, and the person beside you who doesn't have a vaccine, they're going to be at much, much greater risk than you. So don't get so worried about the person beside you who doesn't have a vaccine. That is their individual choice, but they need to know that that individual choice means that they are at much greater risk, even when they come to work, of contracting COVID or when they're out in the community. But you, if you've gotten your vaccine, you got a 95% chance that you're going to be protected or you're going to reduce the chance of serious illness. And that is actually the best thing we can do. So let's not turn it on our head of like who has a vaccine and who doesn't. Let's not get into questioning people's individual choices. Let's just be encouraging. Let's promote informed consent. Let's not worry about the risk of unvaccinated people in our midst as it is them that is at much more risk than you if you've got your vaccine. So let's just reach out. Let's be reasonable. Let's be supportive. Chief. So we got another question here. So will the community center and or MFRC provide summertime care, uh, for example, summer camps like we did last year for military families? Yeah, so uh, those who are on Facebook with MFRC will see they've actually just recently put out an ad advertising for uh, hiring uh, for their, their summer programs. I expect we'll see the, the rec center doing the same thing, but we're doing all that to get ready because we don't yet have when we don't yet have the rules from what uh, the province are going to set for this summer. Just like last year, we did a lot of work to get ourselves ready, and then we had to make a lot of final adjustments at the last minute in order to run our programs in line with the provincial direction. So, July, uh, June 9th is when we hope to have some of these restrictions lifted. Before that, we hope to have some greater clarity as to what we can and can't do after June 9th, and so we are going to continue to follow the province's lead. And we will do our very best to make sure that there is programming available for families here, particularly those just like we did last year, particularly those who whose, whose parents are involved in the essential business of defense and they need to get out and do their job and they need somewhere for their kids to be watched. Not all daycares and everything have, have been shut down. Um, so we'll, we'll be looking at relying on some of the local capacity that still exists. But we'll also look at adding capacity in summer camps and other programs just like we do every year to take care of you. So speaking of military families, so this one was just coming in. It's just a comment and something I think we should address. You know, right now uh, it's starting to be beautiful outside. Kids are outside playing in our in our playgrounds and, and out in the street and skate park and everything else. A lot of them are not wearing masks. A lot of them are not in the same families. They're intermingling. There is some uh, some provincial guidelines on that that are you know seemingly not being followed. You know, I know that we've talked about this in the past about what would we do or what would we have to do should uh, should our dependents not actually follow the rules. You know, this is where I have to reach out to you as parents, those that are out there that have kids that are going to these parks that are doing these things. I, you are really and truly the best person to be informing your kids about how to how to be safe and how to respect the rules. And I need you to link up with your kids and have a serious conversation with them about what it is they're going, what they need to do. Because the only stick that I can wield is closing everything down. I can do that. Um, that's a very blunt, odd, blunt instrument to solve this problem, but it's not what I want to do. So the province has rules about how you can get together. You need to be practicing social distancing even when you're outside. It's quite clear in the provincial direction. You are allowed to have parks, but you're not supposed to mix between households. The only only people that can mix between households are when there's only a small, uh, your family size is under under two or three. And then you can mix with one other group of people, but the total number has to be kept as, as low as possible. So, uh, so just I need everybody to, to do their best to educate their kids. I know my kids are going crazy because we're largely locked in the house. Uh, my daughter got out on a bike ride last night, but she knows every time she steps out that door to take a mask. If she stops anywhere, she needs to put her mask on while she's doing it, just like she did last night up at, uh, up at the McMaster Falls. She got up there on her bike put on her mask and walked around. And I know she did, because I checked up. I trust my daughter, but I also verify. And I'd ask you to do the same with your kids, because you are the role models for your kids. You can't expect the wing to go out and police all this, because the only way I can do it is to shut it all down. And that's just not any place any of us want to go. Now, one of the other big topics that is on everybody's mind right now, you know, including myself, because I've been living through it, is, uh, is the posting situation. Uh, the RHUs, uh, you know, the lack of, uh, of affordable housing, 
um, you know, traveling across multiple jurisdictions in the province and stuff. So I got a question here about, you know, due to the COVID housing crisis and lack of available RHUs, is there going to be a pause on postings in the coming year? I think we both know the answer to that one. Yeah, so um, we are very mindful of the housing challenges. As, as the chief has said, he's had to go through that himself. Uh, he's bought a house uh, that he still hasn't seen yet, right. other than through photos. Uh, he's not the only one. Many of you out there are having to do the same thing. And there are people that are moving here that have bought houses and haven't seen them. And I, I know that we're currently sitting at uh, a priority one wait list of uh, nearing on approaching 100 people for an RHU this year. Um, and we only have about notices of about 30 to 40 people that are currently moving out. So we already have a mismatch in our RHUs as to the people that are coming in. We know that a lot of people, because of their disquiet of having to move uh, families during COVID, are choosing imposed restriction. Uh, and so there's fewer houses on the market available here because some people are choosing not to move, either in our issues or their own. Uh, and similarly at the other end, and we see prices climbing. And I'm not going to tell you I have a lot of easy answers for you. We have gone through and we have there is a has been a reduction of moves this year. Uh, and so we're only moving those people that we have to move. This said, we did this last year as well. And so a lot of people didn't get moved last year because we thought that would be a one year issue. People have been promoted since, and now they're in jobs for which they're over ranked. We have now got people that have retired, and we have jobs that are now sitting empty. Uh, and we have people that are coming in from training units, and they need to have places to go to so they can start into their next level of training so we can fill those experience gaps that we have. So we are doing our level best to keep the movements to as much as to as, le to as little as possible, and we know it's a huge challenge. And we've identified every every week I've been engaging with one Canadian Air Division and other folks, a family advocate and the, R the RCF family advocate to start addressing how we can uh, uh, resolve some of the issues around the move. There are no easy answers. Uh, and I'd like to be able to tell you I could, I could make it all go away, but I can't. Um, so we're working through. So all I can ask is every I've asked for each CEO to bring me the specific cases that are giving trouble. And I'm engaging even on specific cases every week with, uh, with higher headquarters trying to come to solutions. We have some flexibility in the movement in terms of uh, report for duty dates, we also have uh, uh, we also have some flexibility in potentially changing change of strength dates. And there have been some cases where a posting or two has been put, turned off or redirected late in the process because something's just become too unmanageable. But I also know there are people that have already sold their house and haven't acquired a house at the other end, and they're they're, they're quite terrified of what's going to happen because they haven't been able to buy a house at the other end. They've maybe put in eight, ten, or fifteen offers on a house and they still haven't managed to get one at their next posting. I've talked to individuals like that, and I'm gonna tell you that 14 Wing will do everything we can to make sure that you have a roof over your head, no matter what happens. We have accommodations here on base. We have a few options for emergency housing, but if you don't identify yourself to the chain of command, we can't help you. So please talk to your chain of command, bring it forward your issues. We'll do our absolute level best to help everyone uh, get through what is going to be an extremely challenging posting season. So while we're talking about that, I am going to talk about one other thing too, and that is how there's posting messages that you will have received that's that recommend that you either delay your move so that your family gets both your fam the military family gets both their their COVID jabs or their doses in the province of origin, or 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 you you don't you hold off getting vaccinated until you get to your province of destination where you're going to. It's pretty hard to disregard a posting message in a can for gen, but I'm telling you right now as your wing commander, disregard that direction. It's old, it's dated, it hasn't been corrected. I apologize for that. It should have been corrected a while ago. But if you go now, do what the chief's family has already been an example, go out and get the shots that you can for your family here. If you only get one dose, that is okay. If you don't have time to get the second dose before you get to your next province, one dose typically is going to give you 80% protection and you, you and your family need that protection during the move. Um, and you'll then have a record of what dose you've had, whether it's Moderna, Pfizer or whatever. Uh, and then you'll be able to take that to the province you're going. And I'm certain you're going to be able to work out getting that other dose at the other end. So it, the province is now open to 25 plus here for, for vaccinations. I think as of today, by the end of next week, it'll be open to 12 and up for Pfizer, 18 and up for Moderna. Go out, book a shot, get a shot as soon as you can. Don't wait. Disregard that direction that's in that posting message and in that can for Jen. Get the shot, protect you and your family. We will work through the challenges at the other end when you get there. But 80% protection is better than 0% protection. 
And uh, that's going to give you the best the best advice I can give you. We'll move on to uh, another question I had about uh, whether or not we're going to be supporting the Atlantic Air Show this year in uh, Debert. So uh, the wing's participation in the Atlantic Air Show in, in Debert is entirely contingent on being tasked by one Canadian Air Division to do it. At this point, it's still a discussion point. We haven't uh, made a full commitment to Debert because it's really going to depend on local conditions of COVID at the time. So we're waiting to hear out what happens with that. Uh, we don't have what level of support has been approved yet. So we'll figure that out as, as we go, but uh, I fully expect that if it is not safe, then we will not go. Uh, it's going to be quite simple. Uh, we've also had a question about um, changes to CPR uh, and, and first aid kits on the base and says, what are the obligations and limitations to help someone in need of ventilation and compression? Not all the first aid kits on the base are equipped with an overturned uh, valve mouth cover. Right, so there should be, uh, you know, there should be some first aid reps in all of our units. So uh, we're going to ask that all of our unit reps actually go through those first aid kits, find out whether we are missing that uh, that piece, uh, and then in conjunction of working with uh, with our 26 health services as well as the general safety officer, we're going to see about acquiring them to making sure that they're in every in every uh, in every first aid box. And the only other thing I'll say is on that is that. Uh, you really need to be mindful that this is a good reason for you to stay up to up to date and current with your first aid qualification because the, the guidance on first aid and CPRC changes every year. Maybe not dramatically, but it has changed quite a bit in my time uh, in my career. So just stay up to date on that and then you'll know what is the right thing to do. Um, the other question we have is, uh, is uh, does, does the CAF have a vision on what daily work activities will look like post vaccination? And is there a plan to get back to normalcy? Or as the, as the questioner asked, do we just sit and wait? <laughs> I can honestly tell you, I, I, I'm laughing a little bit because not because it's not a valid question, it's an entirely valid question. And I have all those same questions for you. Uh, I can assure you, though, nobody is sitting and waiting to try to figure this one out. Uh, the chief and I have been involved in discussions literally every week uh, for the last six months or so, trying to figure out what the world looks like when vaccinate when everyone is vaccinated. Uh, the challenge we have here is we have uh, ten provinces, we have ten provinces and territories, or sorry, thirteen provinces and territories. We have a federal government, plus we have Department of National Defense direction, and we have to line all of that up in order to understand what the world looks like. As you can see, we have opening pro. We have a, a set of lockdown restrictions here in Nova Scotia. They're different than the ones that are in Manitoba. They're different than the one than the opening plan that's in Quebec, and different than the opening plan, plan that's in Ontario. And so we are trying to create a program by which we recognize that as people get vaccinated, we should have fewer restrictions. Problem is getting consensus as to what those restrictions are going to be. Uh, we're also working on it that if uh, you know, it comes out of we come at this from two two points. There's individual relaxations, which you might enjoy if you have if you have your uh, your vaccinations. But there's also group relaxations that we have to look at that we can really only get to once we have a sufficient knowledge that a wide number of folks have actually been received their 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 two doses of vaccine. And so I'm going to tell you right now, I can't tell you exactly what it's going to look like. Do expect there to be relaxations if you're vaccinated. Do expect that. Overall, general relaxation is going to be tied to a, number, a percentage of the population that has been vaccinated. But what exactly all that looks and when it comes, I don't know. But if you want to partake in any of those relaxations, I can tell you one thing, get your shot. Because if you don't have your, your vaccine and there's relaxations that only apply to people that have had their vaccine, then you're not going to get those, those, those relaxations. Now we do have another question here. Uh, I'll try to read it out here. So yes, everyone has a right or choice for vaccine, but not a right to employment within DND. Why is not deployable, not employable being looked into? DND is supposed to be a deployable asset, and we have drifted so far from the basic tenets of of a resource that I doubt a 14 wing could feel a reactionary force in case of a national emergency. I know you doubt it. I don't. Uh, I've seen what we've been able to do last fall during the midst of the COVID crisis. We did deploy people in a reactionary force. We had people deployed across the North Atlantic in the UK, in Iceland as a reactionary force. We just had people deploy to Op Artemis as a reactionary force to the issues that we're dealing with transnational crime and drugs. Your search and rescue technicians are flying missions every single day as a reactionary force. 
So I have no doubt that we can do this. We can look at not deployable and not employable. Absolutely, I think there is an argument. There's an aspect of what you're saying is quite true. But just understand that most vaccinate, there's a lot of vaccinations which aren't mandatory. There's quite a high number of them. In fact, we're all focused on COVID, but we've never been focused on flu vaccines. You still work every day amongst people who don't get their flu vaccine and have for years and been quite happy to do so. In fact, last year, only 43% of the wing got their flu vaccine, but nobody, nobody refused to come to work during that period of time. So I'm just going to argue to you that I, I think it is something to be concerned about. Um, I think we do need to start looking at, uh, I do think there are going to be ways to provide incentives to people to get their vaccine. But I think kicking people out of the military just because they don't want this COVID vaccine because they have some sort of concerns, I'm not sure is the best place to start just yet. Let's give it time. A lot of folks may come around. COVID vaccines might become the kind of vaccine in time might become so common and ubiquitous that you're going to be like the vaccines you have as a kid, in which case, It'll be a condition, perhaps, of getting your kids into school and the like. We got to see what this world looks like. But that's why I think we shouldn't get too wrapped around the axle just yet. We have plenty of time to sort this out. It's still early days. Yeah, and you got to remember as well that we've only got about five or six percent of our of our military personnel that have refused a vaccine right now, and that's today. And, and should a named operation happen that it was requiring requiring a vaccination? Uh, they will be given the option once again to actually choose the vaccination uh, or, or not. And then, uh, you know, we'll go from there. And like I said, just because you just because you were hesitant today or yesterday or last week, if you change your mind, come forward. I have a vaccine for you and I will make sure you get your both both your doses. I'm open to anybody changing their mind. Uh, one of the questions we had is a program that's been kind of hanging out there for a bit is PACE. Do you want to talk about PACE, Chief? Yeah, sure. So PACE, of course, the new evaluation system that's going to replace CIFPAS uh, should have been implemented already or at least started. It, it was a trial, you know, specifically with the ASOPs uh, here at uh, 14 Wing over the last fiscal year. Uh, the last that I had heard is that it was delayed 30 days from a new implementation plan that was going to bring us to the end of April. It's now the end of May. Uh, we're waiting on a can for gen and deputy minister direction on on that. So expect the can for gen to come out with what's going to happen on that. No word yet uh, as to what date is going to start. OK. Um, Bob, we're having a bunch of questions about fitness centers. Maybe we'll turn ahead to fitness and fitness center and opening and closing on that for the next little bit. So uh, one of the questions we've had is that uh, why is the fitness center closed, but everything else on base is open and I can go into any hangar and work but I can't go to the fitness center and keep myself fit. And do I think we could have kept the fitness center open? So uh, it's a tricky balance all the time uh, in order to figure out what it is we absolutely must do and things that we, 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 we can't do. So the province has made it quite clear that they want gyms and fitness centers closed because they're a place where people come together. Now I'm gonna tell you, I think I've always thought our fitness center was quite uh, safe. I'm a big believer that we had great, great procedures in place. But I also have to make sure that I'm that we here at the wing are setting the example for the local community and we can't be seen to be flouting what the province is doing. Now you'll say what but yet we're all coming to work. Not all of us, but many people are coming to work. Sure, because doing the defense of the nation, doing that business is essential. Going to the gym is really important. I'm a big believer in it. I work out every single day myself, but there are ways to work out that don't involve the fitness center. And you can do it. Now, uh, we have part of the reason why the fitness center is closed and my thought process on this is that right now when you go to work, you effectively kind of have a work family. You have those close people that you work with and those are the people you interact with every day. And then you go home and you have your home family. And so I've kept you in a very small bubble. And I do that on purpose because if I keep in that bubble as small as I can, I'm protecting you. If I open it up and I start having the gym open, we're going to have you people who don't normally interact with each other on the wing starting to interact together at the gym. And then all it takes is one case and I can and multiple units can be taken out by a COVID case and isolation requirements. In fact, I think we all those who were at the tow bar a few weeks back understand this because after the tow bar incident, we had while nobody got infected with COVID in the tow bar, I'll be clear, not a single person was infected and the person who who, who had later tested positive had no knowledge at the time that they were at the tow bar, that they were po po uh, positive with COVID. They only found out two days after they were at the bar. 
the fact that we had so many different units there did create some risk. And so we've proved that our PHMs can work. Nobody got sick from the Tovar incident because people followed the rules. People stayed at their tables by and large. And as a result, we were safe through that. But now that we're in this heavier lockdown and variants of concern are out there, it's a matter of keeping us protected and reducing the chance that I'll have to have up to 90 people in isolation like we did shortly after the Tovar incident. So we don't want to do that again. Um, a, a huge believer in fitness. I encourage you to get online, look at the PSP online workouts. They're putting them out just about every day. There's all sorts of things we can do. Uh, we don't yet, we aren't yet signing out the outdoor equipment at the, at the gym and the fitness center because we're supposed to be staying home and we're supposed to be doing only essential activity. If I start giving you canoes and a bunch of other things, then that means you're going to be encouraged to go out and do things that aren't essential, which again is against the provincial guidance right now. So we will look at what we can do to open this stuff up as fast as we can. We were the first wing in the Canadian Forces to have its gym fully open. We were the first wing to have things at the mess. We will continue to try to lead in that way, but we just got to do that only that when it's safely, when we can do it safely. And so that leads to the next question, which was, can you speak to what is happening with fitness test requirements during the shutdown? So during the period we have here, you can't do your force test because the gym is shut down. We are looking at what, how we can get increased capacity for the force test to make sure that those who must have it get it done before uh, they get promoted or they have to deploy. Uh, so we have some time for some people that are going away uh, uh, that in order to get that done, and we'll look at prioritizing our way through it. But just like last year, like every year before, your fitness test is not linked to your PER anymore. So you can go to a board without a fitness test. You just can't be promoted without it. And we'll look, if we get into a case where somebody has not been able to do their fitness test, simply because the gym has not been open, we'll definitely look at each case by case and see what we can do to make sure that you get the promotion you deserve, even if we can't do the test that, you, that, that we need to do. I'm going to add on to that because I know that this is something that's been ongoing now for the last year. Now, we, we were able to open up. The gym was open. They were doing fitness tests for more than six months here. I managed to get my fitness test done and completed. Other people did, and some people didn't. Some people just thought, well, you know what? I don't need it right now. I'm just going to hold off. I'm not going to go and do it. And then we're back in a lockdown again. And then you're saying, I can't do my fitness test. When this, when the lockdown is finished, and it will, it, it will finish. And I'm confident that uh, you know the summer is not, uh, is not gone. It's gonna, it's gonna happen, and we're gonna be able to go out again. I'm, I'm hoping that it's gonna be before I get a chance to, to leave to say goodbye to people. Uh, but when that happens, I encourage you to go out there and get that fitness test. Don't use the COVID as an excuse, uh, because I, I can tell you that even in Ottawa, they're looking at that and saying, you guys had the, uh, the opportunity to do that for many, many months. Why didn't you? Uh, one of the questions that came in is, is there talk of the military imposing a vaccine passport for travel and training and ops outside of Canada? So right now there isn't such, there is no such thing yet as a vaccine passport. What we're doing is each, the commander of CJOC gets to determine for every op that happens outside the country, whether or not COVID is a mandatory requirement or not. And so we're, they'll determine that. You don't then need a passport. What you need is a DAG process, that departure or assistance group. And through the DAG process, you'll either DAG Red, yellow, or green for having your for having a COVID vaccine. So, uh, if if it's and in fact a requirement for the operation. So that's how that'll work. We do have some countries that will eventually start imposing uh, needing to have proof that you've been vaccinated before you've been entered. That is certainly about to happen, and uh, we'll have your medical records here that we can produce records of to present to the country of that we need to get to uh, in order to do that. So at this point, there's no specific passport. Uh, by all means, you're all going to be expected, no doubt, to get your immunization booklets updated in due course. We haven't done that, all of that in the vaccine clinics, but we're going to be doing that, I think, on all the second doses. You're supposed to bring your booklet in. That isn't a passport per se, but it is a record that you've been vaccinated and we'll want to maintain that. So what's what it has happened, I, I did get my uh, my vaccination booklet. Uh, I, I asked for it to be updated yesterday. They weren't they weren't planning on doing that. They just give you this little business card type of thing. Uh, you know, I do think that we need to look at some form of uh, doing uh, doing it a little bit better uh, than that because people are going to be moving around and certainly pro provinces and people like that that ask for that or businesses or airlines uh, will, will need some something along those lines. But why don't we give them something uh, positive to sure. talk about or whatever. So somebody has asked, you know, I've seen crews working on the outdoor pool recently. Is there a plan to have the outdoor pool open this summer? Yes. So last year I had to make a choice uh, in order to fund uh, daycare programs and summer camps. 
it was a pretty tough choice, but I needed to save about $50,000 so I could invest it into you, our people who have children who need to have summer camps. Um, and so that was a pretty tough decision we had to make, but at the time it was the right decision because it allowed us to have camps. Uh, thanks to some fantastic financial work by our PSP staff, our wing controller and the deputy wing commander, we've actually been managed to uh, what we thought was going to be, take a devastating hit to the wing fund that funds all these sorts of activities. We actually managed to come out marginally, about $1,000 ahead of where we expected uh, last year. And so we actually have the funds this year to open the pool. And so as long as the province allows for it, we're going to open it. Uh, it's going to be probably around July 1st, but it'll all depend on what the province says. So yes, if you really are a big fan of the outdoor pool uh, and, you're, and you want to be able to go to it, we'll do our very best to get that open this year. Let's talk about back to uh, here. We'll talk about this one. Uh, some members were not able to take LTA to visit their families last fiscal year due to COVID restrictions. Is there any provision to allow members to take two LTA trips during this fiscal year? There, there's no policy that allows that to happen just yet, but that's actually not a half bad idea. We'll make sure we put pass that up uh, up to one Canadian Air Division to say that, you know, there is a lot of, as I can understand, there's a lot of travel that's pent up that people want to do. And once it's safe to do so, I think there'll be a desire to try to facilitate that. But budgets being what budgets are, the money that we had last year and we didn't use, the way the federal government process works, it goes right back to paying down the debt and the deficit. That's just the way it is. So that money isn't sitting in a bank account. So it makes it a bit tough to carry over activities from one year to the next. But uh, we'll, we'll ask that question, make that suggestion. It is leave travel assistance as well. And so if you didn't take any leave, it's pretty hard to use it. So uh, carrying it over, I don't believe is in the policy. So. Uh, we've had a couple of questions about uh, pop-up testing and whether people should uh, participate in asymptomatic testing or rapid testing here at the province and whether they can, as military members, go out to do that. Yes, you can. Uh, I've been tested at the Berwick Asymptomatic Clinic. I went there last Sunday, got my test, got my result by Tuesday. Really, really slick operation. You book it online, really simple. You just have to take your Blue Cross card. That's all they need to see. They don't actually need a health card. They know how to treat military people there. If we had a rapid clinic here in Kingston for two days on Monday and Tuesday of this week, I saw people going there proudly in uniform and getting their rapid test. Excellent, really happy to see that. They got their results quickly by email as well. So the whole concept of asymptomatic testing and rapid testing is that we're trying to help locate and isolate COVID in the valley. Uh, and it also is a way of protecting your, your coworkers, your family by knowing for sure that you're not walking around unbeknownst to you with COVID. Now, the beauty of asymptomatic testing and rapid testing is that when you go for those tests, you do not, do not have to isolate afterwards. We have no expectation that you have COVID. And so unless you get a positive result, you don't have to isolate. And so I encourage everyone to take advantage of, of the online booking tool that you can do and you can go to Berwick. That will mean you have to leave your municipality, but getting tested for COVID is essential. That is something you are allowed to do. Um, if they have another pop-up rapid test clinic here in Kingston, I encourage you to go to it as well. And in fact, the wing is looking at actually doing our own part in helping localize uh, COVID here. 26 Health Services has now put out a new protocol and starting on Wednesday this week at lunch times, all the information will go up on the web, but there is going to be a rapid testing clinic for 14 wing members right here at your 26 Health Services, a capacity to do about 20 to 30 each week. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at making that getting people in that have perhaps more contacts than they're comfortable with. They have no symptoms and they, have never been to, they haven't been told that they've been exposed, but they just want to have an additional piece of assurance that they are safe and that their workplace is safe. And we'll have that available for two. It won't be have enough capacity to do everybody every week. That would be a huge monumental task, but it will give us that extra measure. But you can also use these facilities down in the province out in, out in Berwick and in Kingston without any problem. So the mantra now goes, stay safe, stay healthy, get vaccinated and get tested. Oh, and stay the blazes home. Here's a question for uh, more on, on the uh, COVID. Uh, has the wing looked into antigen testing for SARS-CoV-2 to get an idea of how many personnel at the 14 wing have contracted the virus to do a more thorough risk assessment? So we don't have a facility right now to do antigen testing here at 14 Wing, and uh, and the Canadian Forces hasn't uh, embarked on a plan to do a more broad survey 
see who has had COVID and who hasn't. In part because uh, just because you've had COVID doesn't mean you shouldn't still get vaccinated. In fact, the, the medical advice is you still need to get vaccinated even if you have had COVID. So there's only a, a very small handful of people in this local community that have had COVID. Those people still need to go out and get vaccinated. So at the end of the day, once we've done that, you won't be able to tell through the antigen testing whether or not you've had COVID or not because you're going to have the antigens in your body from the vaccine. So it'll be difficult uh, at the end of the day to do a, a quality survey. So my be our best defense is not necessarily to hang our hat on antigen testing, but to get the, get the vaccine, because then you'll know you're protected. Okay, a quick question about uh, reservists and vaccination. I know it's gone back and forth very recently about whether or not we were able to vaccinate them as well. So questions about uh, medical care for class A and surge B class reservists. Are there any possibilities that the wing will be able to provide vaccines to these reservists? So what we've done, uh, we've already have uh, a list of about 50 reservists that we've identified that are critical to the wing's function. Um, not to say that not everybody's critical, but in order to get reservists uh, vaccinated, I have to get the Minister of National Defense to approve it. And so he's not going to approve just everybody. Uh, in fact, he, what, he's, what, what they're going to do is try to get those that are essential to doing core functions of what this wing does. So we have Class A and, and uh, Surge Class B reservists in 413 squadrons, for example, that are critical to supporting search and rescue operations. We have members of our uh, Air Reserve Augmentation Flight that if they don't, that if they get sick and can't do their work, then we can't pay reservists, which is something I have to be able to do. So we've already identified about 50 personnel that have already been approved. They've been contacted, they've been scheduled, and they'll get vaccines. And that's going to be a great way to get them vaccinated. But for everyone else, if you're over the age of 25, you can make an appointment right now. You can make an appointment right now downtown. Don't wait for us. Go downtown, get your vaccine. So that's going to cover most of our reservists already. There might be a few that are younger than that that can't get their, their vaccine downtown. But guess what? By next week, it's going to be 12 and up. So I know it's a question that weighs on your mind and you want to get your vaccine as fast as you can. I could go through a process and try to get everybody approved. We've already put up all the names. But only 50 been approved so far, and the province is going to get you your vaccine by the end of next week, at least allow you to schedule it, and that's the fastest way. So that's what I want you to do. If you are currently a Class A or not, or less than 180 days Class B, book through the province as soon as you are eligible, and then that's the best way to get your vaccine. Can your rationale for boundaries regarding local travel be clarified, given that most cases are happening closer to Halifax, uh, fights going to, let's say, Annapolis Royal? Sure. Um, so the, the issue that we have here and what Dr. Strang, for those who've listened to Dr. Strang talk about why the municipal boundaries are there, uh, why this limitation is in place, is because of a chain of infection that can happen. So uh, folks in Halifax are absolutely in a much higher risk scenario right now. They have vaccine, they have all sorts of, of COVID popping up, lots of exposure sites. That person who's in Windsor, who's going to make a quick trip across the border in from Kings County into West Hants, they're going to be the person that if they make that trip, they're going to run into somebody from Halifax, potentially who has COVID, and then you're going to bring it back to Windsor. And then that person who's in Windsor, if they then take a trip down to Wolfville, another municipality separate from Kings County, if they go down to Wolfville and make, and make a trip there or New Minus or Kentville, they're going to create an exposure spot there. And now suddenly, there's a hot spot of COVID there, and the person from Greenwood who came up to New Minus or came up to Kentville to do their shop is now suddenly going to be exposed. And so it's true, the greatest exposure site is in Halifax, but you mustn't think that you're protected just because you're living in the valley. There is a chain of exposure that can still happen if people don't stay within the municipality. Now, it's somewhat arbitrary to figure out, to define it as municipalities only, and I know this is causing a lot of angst. I know there are people that are living in Kings County that have a cabin in Annapolis County. They're friends of mine. I know that's tough. But the Dr. Strang made it quite clear just actually two days ago in his teleconference, uh, video, video conference. The issue is it's this constant movement. This constant movement allows this chain of propagation to continue. And what we're trying to do is get people to stay put in one place so we break the chain of propagation. And that means that those here in the Valley are going to feel a little bit of a pinch because we can't do things like go to Cloud Lake. And you're saying, but boss, Cloud Lake is in Kings County. Actually, no, it's not. Cloud Lake is in Annapolis County. Unfortunately, East Torbrook Road doesn't have a sign on it that tells you that. 
So you're going to drive down East Torbrook Road, hop onto Fire Lane, and by the time you're on Fire Lane, you're already breaking the provincial rules and subject to a $2,000 fine. Then you're going to drive all the way down Fire Lane and get to a parking lot, which is still in Annapolis County. Now it's true, you can get all out of that lake and halfway through that lake, there's the boundary to Kings County and you'd be fine, but you couldn't get to the lake without breaking the law. So, and that means that somebody who has a cabin just somewhere, they're living here in the RHUs, but they have a cabin just in Annapolis County, it's, it, it stinks, it stinks. But we're doing this because what we're trying to do is break the chain of, uh, of propagation so that we don't have people bringing the virus further down the valley, because all it's going to take you going to your cabin and say down by Annapolis Royal, you have bumped into somebody in your minus, and now you go down to Annapolis Royal for something that's not essential because you have a house over your head already, and you bump into somebody else, and now Annapolis Royal has COVID. You didn't mean it to happen, but it happened all the same. So this is how we're going to break the chain of propagation. And I know it's tough. I know it's not fun. And I'll be honest, I don't like it any more than you, but it is the right thing to do. So in fact, you know, a few, few months back, my wife and I ordered a nice gift for the chief and his wife as they're getting ready to head out. It's sitting in Middleton and I can't pick it up. And he's leaving in a couple of weeks. Yeah, that was a really good idea a couple of months ago, but it's not, I'm not feeling too smart about it right now. But that happens. This is what you have to accept happens. The gift is going to stay in Middleton unless I can find some clever way to get somebody from Middleton to bring it to the base for me. But I'm not making that drive because that would be breaking the provincial rules. I've gone for long rides and long bike, long runs. I run to the border and I turn around. And if you're not sure, you don't believe me, you can check my garment. I'm turning around each time. I'm not going into middle Berwick even if I want to. There's some great coffee shops there. Haven't been to Berwick. I'm staying within Kings County and that's just the way it is. And it's not fun. It's just the way it is. So I'd ask, this weekend is beautiful. A lot of people want to get out and do lots of stuff. Just make sure you know where you are. Make sure your activity is approved because it's a $2,000 fine if you're caught. Uh, I'm, I can't watch you everywhere you go, and it's $2,000 for every adult. And on top of that, there's a $400 court fee. So there's two gentlemen who came down from Halifax to go shad fishing in Middleton, and they thought it was a great idea. $2,400 each is what they're paying now for having come down to go shad fishing. That's a pretty damn expensive fish. Uh, I'd also say, you know, thinking that you're just going to hop on your ATV and dive out into the woods and nobody will know. Last week, I watched six RCMP go bomb and by, all kitted up on their ATVs. They were on the Harvest Moon Trail last weekend, and I know the reason why they were doing that was so they could be all out in the woods this weekend. So I'm just asking you. I know it's tough. It's a sacrifice, and you don't like it. You don't have to like it. But please, please. Know what you're doing and obey the rules. Because if I if you found out you've broken the rules, you're gonna get a fine from the from the province. And once I find out about it, I will have to do it because you will have broken a uh, you will have broken a direct order from your wing commander as well. And it won't be fun. Yeah, about three more questions here. Okay. Uh, one is uh, that you know the wing cleaners are considered essential due to the need to keep COVID at bay, but why are they not being vaccinated with the rest of the people on the base? Because you're, if you're over 25 years old, we will get your vaccine downtown right now. Uh, that's that's the short answer. We've actually asked for wing cleaners to get vaccinated. We actually put up that request some months ago. Uh, we made our case and they went through. They had to look at the total amount of vaccine that was available for the Canadian Armed Forces that we have, the number of people that need to get it. And then they also had to look at the rollout schedules for all the provinces. And the calculation was made that, by the, that if we wanted to make sure we had all of our serving members vaccinated as fast as we could so we could maximize our operations, that we had to make a choice. And the choice was that it would only make a difference of about a week or two because we are only now getting into that second dose here at a mass vaccination clinic. And if you're over 25, you can start scheduling your first dose now. So it hasn't made much of a change, the difference between what the military people are doing and what civilians can do. So get out there, get your vaccine. One of the questions, uh, and this happens even before COVID, you know, one of the questions was about uh, plastic cutlery uh, that they've been using at the mess hall for months and months. Uh, it's generating a lot of excess waste. Uh, I know that I went over there just the other day uh, following my vaccination and went down and actually uh, spoke to uh, the staff there that are working at the, at the kitchen. And so they recognize that that's the case. So the reason why, of course, they're using plastic cutlery is because they can't put the, the metal utensils out for people to grab and pick through themselves. As well, they are preparing all this food and like your salads, your individual stuff, everything is cut up so that you're, uh, you're not there asking for stuff. 
uh, it's already pre-prepared. Now that takes a lot of time, takes a lot of resources, so they don't have that, that the resources to start putting little packages together of metal utensils and so forth. What they are doing though is they're exhausting what they have in plastic uh, and they've already put in orders. They, they're contracting out to get actually new uh, utensils that are made out of bamboo. Uh, so that will be coming into the mess hall at your shoe. And then I got a big question, I guess, uh, in somebody's mind is like, uh, who's the new wing commander this summer? So uh, for some, this is going to be, what I'm about to say is going to be really good news. For some, it's going to be bad news. And for others, it probably doesn't impact your life that much. But I'm happy to say that I've been extended until 2022 as your wing commander. That's a request that I put in because my daughter is in her, uh, will start her last year of high school in the fall. Uh, and I was hoping to have her graduate, not through three different high schools, but just through two in her life. And so we're, the military has been good enough to grant us that, uh, that, that option to stay here one more year. It will mean my son will then have to move in his last year of high school, but well, I love them both, but I, some, some years, I guess I can't love them equally, thanks to the military. Um, but, uh, and great news, it's, so it's great news for me and my family. Uh, we're looking forward to it. I, this is a job that I have truly loved doing. It is a huge challenge every day, and I know there are days when I come uh, come home and uh, I'm dragging my feet behind me, and I'm pretty tired. But uh, but it is something I love doing. But with everything in the military, they uh, they give you great opportunities, and then they also ask high things of you. And so uh, while I'm going to be here till next summer, uh, in in the August September time frame, at a date to be determined yet, I'm deploying to Qatar for four months. I'm going there as the battle director of the Combined Air Operations Center. So for those of you who are looking for a change, you're about to get it, but then I'll be back. Um, so somewhere around about December, January timeframe, I'll be coming back from that job. Uh, during my absence, we will have an acting wing commander here. It'll be one of the COs. Uh, details on that are going to be worked out. Uh, once I've finished, figured out all the training requirements that I have, I've got to get down to Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina for about a week this summer to do some training. Uh, and then uh, and then we've got to figure out all the pre-deployment leave and the like. So. I am sticking around, but uh, but I'll also be off for a little bit, uh, gallivanting around a camp. Won't be all that exciting, I'm sure. Lots of work to be done, but it'll be a nice. It will be a change of scenery, and I will miss 14 wing during that time. But uh, I will see you back again uh, before very long after that. Okay. One more question is coming in here shortly. Okay. Uh, I think I've talked about weekend plans. Uh, that pop up clinic I talked about. It's going to be uh, 12:30 to 1:30 on Wednesdays at the uh, clinic. They'll have a, a room for you to have 10 booked appointments for the rapid testing, and they'll do another 20 walk-in spaces available on a first come first serve. We'll have a graphic out which will explain uh, explain all the rules on how you can get booked in for that. Okay, so the Premier of Nova Scotia stated uh, that the community is defined as the municipality where you live. The municipality of King spans from Meadowvale Road to Scotts Bay and the Hans County border. Members can travel throughout the municipality, meaning they can go to Berwick, New Minas, and further. Actually, Berwick is its own municipality. There's actually an order, which I've shared on my Facebook page, uh, and we, we try to get it out. And you can search it on the REMO, that's the uh, Regional Emergency Management Organization for Kings County, which actually has the order in detail. You'll see in there, it has a map, and it also has an annex, and that annex outlines every single municipality that is covered by that order in Nova Scotia. So Middleton is its own is its own municipality separate from Annapolis County. Kings and Greenwood are villages and therefore fall under the rubric of the municipality of County of Kings. Berwick is its own town, and so it is inside of Kings County, absolutely, but it's its own municipality. And so you can't go into Berwick uh, unless you live in Berwick. Uh, or unless you have essential business, like you're going to get a, an asymptomatic test. New Minus is a village, so technically you can go to New Minus. Absolutely. You can't go to Kentville, you can't go to Wolfville. Town of Windsor is a town. Um, this is all quite complicated. So what I'd ask you to do is get educated. Read up. The orders are quite simple. If you were to search for a list of municipalities, Google it. Municipalities in the province of Nova Scotia, it's all there. And then you can search the order at Remo, King, Remo Kings County Facebook page. It's R-E-M-O Kings County. You can look it up there. They have all the information. I'll make sure I share it out again today to make sure that everybody knows uh, can, can, who can, has links to my Facebook page uh, knows where you can get that information. But uh, we are quite a patchwork of municipalities here. It is complicated. I get it. 
but just make sure you know your municipality. Make sure you know what you're doing before you do it. One more. Yep. And uh, so we recently had a summit on, uh, on professional conduct. And so somebody's asking us to really like to know how that went. Yeah. So um, so uh, we had a summit. Yes, it was uh, yesterday. No, two days ago. Days are blurring together. Sorry. Uh, we had a professional conduct summit two days ago here at 14 Wing where we did a couple things. First of all, what we did is we actually opened the floor up to uh, a wide variety of folks to be able to come in and give us their stories, their testimonials of how they've been treated while in uniform with regards to professional misconduct and give that message directly to the chief warrant officers and COs of this wing. We had about six different people provide testimonials. And I'll be honest, Chief, it was kind of heartbreaking. It was a very tough day. We knew it was coming. I knew these stories were out there and I wanted them to come forward because unless we get educated as leadership on the challenges that are impacting the front line, we won't be able to solve the problems. So uh, we had some people that were extraordinarily brave and courageous come forward and tell their stories of the way they've been treated. There are issues of people who have been who've had been treated with misogynistic behavior, that people have been treated with racist behavior. We have people who have just had toxic leadership uh, 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 in their workplace. We've had people who've watched uh, co-workers and other people in the organization advance even when they know that they're not doing their work. And they who are pointing out that somebody's not doing their work are finding they're being punished for having been truthful to the chain of command. None of these are the things that I consider acceptable. So part of what we are doing in, in that while having those testimonials come forward is that we built a professional conduct action plan framework. A, long, a, long, a long, lot of bunch of words to say that we've identified what we believe the problem is. It comes in across four different things. We have people that are just acting unprofessionally, people who don't know what standards they're supposed to be to be maintaining, people that are not getting the training they need and the leadership skills to be able to do the things they're doing, and we're not necessarily holding people accountable to the extent that we should be doing. All four of those things are part of the problem that we've identified. There are other other parts to the problem as well, but those are the four broad strokes. Our professional conduct action plan has us working along four line, or three lines of effort, listening, learning, and acting. We did part of that listening yesterday, but it's not something that's done there. We are gonna use the employment equity groups that we have here at the wing to establish focus groups, to hear more stories and get more things that we need to, to fix on this wing. We know there's lots more out there, I know for a fact when we did our, we've done our town halls, there's always been underlying questions that are there that maybe are, are, are meant, but maybe not voiced. And so we know we need to pull those stories out. We also know that we need to start educating people more on what we expect of your behavior. We've done a very good job over the years of highlighting all the things you're not supposed to do, but what is the example you're supposed to follow? I'd argue that we provided four excellent examples today of people that are good examples of people you need to start looking to and following. There are many more on this wing because we've handed out command commendations and coins to lots of people that are setting good examples. Look to those people. But we will also go through the CAF, uh, the code, the Canadian Armed Forces Code of Values and Ethics, and we're going to go out and roll out individual little training sessions, not as PowerPoint till you die from it, but as discussions at the local level in bite-sized amounts to small groups to help educate you on what we expect. And then we are going to be looking at putting in, uh, getting out more knowledge about how to report issues. I know one of the main complaints we have is that it's too complicated, it's too difficult, and sometimes there's a fear of having of, of what will happen if you report. So we're going to go on an information campaign to put out all the different ways you can report. You'll see that for each case, there's multiple different ways to report, and I encourage you to use any one or all of those methods to report misconduct here at 14 way because if we don't report it we can't fix it and we are looking at how we can establish an anonymous reporting mechanism here at 14 way we have details to work out with that it's an important aspect because we know there are people who want to get their story out but they don't want to have their name attached to their story or they have or at least they want to have start a discussion from a, from a position of confidentiality until they are comfortable enough to then go forward farther with their story and they also want to have some control, some uh, feeling that they have some input as to the process as it moves forward. All of that is important and we are working on that. So one conduct session done, 
it is not that is does not mean we've solved the problem. I have a bunch of work to do this weekend to get uh, tasks out to 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 uh, commanding officers and chief warrant officers to build the next step of actions that we're going to take. And we'll have another summit in about a month's time. Where we're going to talk about the things that are done that are going to start being delivered. And then we'll be writing articles regularly in Aurora, kind of explain the thought processes, the methodology we're going through here. And we ask you to stay in touch with that and uh, and, and, and respond to it and, and get involved. Professional conduct is something that we all have to be engaged in. We all have to be focused on being a good example to the people that, that, that work for us, that work alongside us. And we all have a role to play in holding each other accountable. At the end of the day, even an aviator on the ground at the front line who sees something that is inappropriate has the ability to report it. I want to hear it. And uh, if, if we don't hear it, we can't fix it. And so your voice is important to us. We're going to try to make more, make sure you understand how to make your voice heard and make sure that we take action when your voice is heard. Dan, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, that's good, sir. So, uh, it, so time to wrap up now. Um, we've got a few more things to go. I know I want to pass the floor over to, to Chief Campbell here shortly, but before I do that, we have one more award presentation that we need to do. So this is the, as the chief mentioned, this is going to be the final time that I'll sit beside Chief Campbell as my wing chief warrant officer. Indeed, for any major function we're going to do here at 14 wing, effective one June, Chief Campbell will become the division chief warrant officer a job which I'm highly confident that he's going to excel at. But before he has to, before he heads off to that, we have some hardware to bestow. So Dan, as I've told you in private, you are the recipient of this year's RCF Association Air Marshal C.R. Sleeman Trophy. This award recognizes the outstanding performance of an individual member of the Royal Canadian Air Force particularly focusing on non-commissioned members. This individual is designated the Aviator of the Year. Chief Campbell has a, had a stellar and impactful career leading to his current appointment as the Wing Chief Warrant Officer and his soon-to-be appointment as the Divisional Chief Warrant Officer. He's had 30 years in uniform. He's made it, and during that time, he's made it his mission to have a profound and positive impact on the Royal Canadian Air Force, its members, and his peers. And that impact has been particularly evident, in my view, in the last year during the COVID crisis. You commenced your career in the fighter community in Cold Lake. You've established your credibility early in your career with skills as an aircraft technician. And since then, you've served in many different capacities. You've deployed across the country, indeed around the world. And you've committed to education and to enhance, uh, to enhance education and to better utilize leadership skills and through all that, you continue to improve your own skills by recently completing a master's in defense studies and in leadership. You've been an outstanding advocate for mental health and social health and suicide prevention here at 14 Wing. You've shared your own research, your own work, and your own personal experiences with the Wing, uh, at town hall and other appearances, unit visits, and you've even, I know, been involved in individual interventions. This has contributed to greatly destigmatizing uh, mental health issues here at 14 Wing, and these are what may have made you a highly visible advocate. Your ability to calmly handle yourself and install confidence in others during a crisis has been particularly evident during COVID-19. You provided the vision for and oversaw the execution of physically distanced or online wing social events that brought some sense of normalcy to this crisis for many of the wing and community members, and that has continued to evolve as restrictions were lifted and we look to get back to that very shortly. As so well, read the formal citation here. For more than 30 years, Chief Warrant Officer Dan Campbell has been an outstanding airman, leader, and ambassador of the Royal Canadian Air Force. He has consistently promoted education and mentorship and been a tireless advocate for the mental health and suicide prevention. During the COVID crisis, his fair and judicious use of leadership and discipline inspired loyalty, fostered morale, and promoted the well being of 14 Wing, and was a positive influence within the Royal Canadian Air Force and abroad. Dan, congratulations on being the recipient of this year's Air Marshal C. Roy Sleeman Award for Leadership. Thank you very much, Jack. Oh, wow. 
So um, I'll just close up by saying, Dan, uh, you've been in Greenwood now for three years, two of which you've been, I've served alongside you. You have been, you have an incredible passion for helping people and you have a passion for doing the right thing, no matter how hard or how much cost it is to you to get it done. I see the hours you put in, I see the hard work, and I've been impressed every single day. Without a doubt, you have been there for 14 Wing for me and my family when the chips were down. You fought alongside me in the times we've challenged HQ. We've got to get some substantive changes, and uh, we didn't win all those fights. We got lots of bruises doing it, uh, but we always found the time to relish those fights and raise a glass afterwards, either in victory or commiseration, whichever the case may be. 14 Wing has gotten to where it is today by combined effort of everyone at this wing, but I know that I could not have played my small part in all of that if I hadn't had you alongside me every step of the way. I have relied on you as my command partner in some pretty dark days. You have advised me, inspired me, and at times carried me along. So you are without a doubt one of the finest members of the Canadian Armed Forces I've ever had the pleasure of serving with. What I'll remember most of our time here is that Pretty much every day we've decided to not just sit idly by and wait for the world to come to us. We've looked at ways that we could make 14 win better and we've committed each day to make actions, to take actions each day together to make that happen. We didn't always accomplish all of our goals, but we had a hell of a time fighting our way to get to them. And so I'm ever in your debt. I wish you, Sonia and Brandon, all the best of luck in Winnipeg. Thank you, sir. So, I said I was not going to get choked up in your <laughs> trying to get through all of this stuff. And uh, yeah, so, so I don't have to tell you where I'm going uh, up to Winnipeg, going from the best place in the country to perhaps the worst right now for COVID. Uh, you know, so I, I did write out some stuff that I wanted to say to the wing. This is not exactly the way that I wanted to part, uh, but certainly, uh, you know, hopefully restrictions are lifted. Before I leave, I'll get an opportunity to say uh, say my goodbyes to a lot of people in person. I can tell you that uh, three years ago, I was told I was moving to Greenwood to serve as the Wing Chief Warrant Officer, the largest Air Force base in the Maritimes. I heard all the great stories about it being tucked away in a beautiful Annapolis Valley. Uh, I heard about how people came here and didn't want to leave. I didn't quite understand it. Uh, when I first visited here, it was a year before I actually took the position I was coming in here as the, as the Sif State School Chief uh, to, to give a speech and there wasn't much of a town and I kind of drove through it and, and missed it and then uh, then got onto the base and it was winter time and it was cold and, and it was dark and, and then I left. Uh, but now I understand. I have, I, have, I have lived across this country in multiple provinces doing multiple jobs uh, and I can tell you that uh, this is one, one area of the country that has definitely grown on me and my family, and I appreciate uh, I appreciate this, this community. Um, first off, I guess I would like to thank my family for their support. Uh, my children, my wife Sonia. Uh, Sonia's not able to watch because she doesn't have a DND account, but maybe this will be live streamed later and she can see it. But uh, you know, she supported me through you know five moves in the last twelve years, uh, two years of master's degree, uh, shared me with this wing uh, so that I could do the best job that I could. Uh, she worked full time. She volunteered at the MFRC. Uh, she was by my side through every success and every traumatic event at 14 Wing, and we all know we had some of those. Uh, she raised my spirits uh, when I was both physically and mentally exhausted. She ensured that I took out, you know, looked after myself and my, most, my, my mental and physical health, and, and for that I say thank you and I love you. Um, normally, if she was here and we were doing a change of point of ceremony, I would offer up some flowers to my spouse to say thank you. Uh, she's decided that in, in uh, you know, in quick fashion, that rather than taking flowers that will probably die that I won't be able to take with us, uh, what we've done, what she's decided to do is to put the money towards a certificate. So I've got here a, a, a gift certificate that I'm going to donate to the MFRC, uh, to Margaret, uh, and it is for a house cleaning uh, to be given to a deserving member military family here on the wing to give them a break. So thank you, Sonia, for doing that. Uh, without, a, without a doubt, the biggest asset to this wing are its people. I want to highlight some of the successes and the accomplishments that I am most proud of. Um, from all the public rescues on the high seas uh, to, the, to the private personal rescues and interventions uh, in support of fellow service members right here on the wing. A successful place removing illicit drugs 
from the world, enforcing embargoes, and of course, chasing submarines. Uh, by far the most productive meeting I had in the last three years but it was with a few eight-year-olds, uh, which resulted in the building of the Dandelion Park, which let, uh, let all of our children know that they are important. Uh, thank you to the lodger units who are often forgotten, uh, who are a central part of 14 Wing, and 26 Health Services and their staff for supporting all our members through health and, and mental health, as well as through all the COVID crisis and getting us all vaccinated. Uh, this wing and your families have demonstrated great courage. You've overcome fear and managed through three waves of a pandemic, supported the local community, businesses, food bank, and each other. Our mess and entertainment committees created safe spaces for all of us to enjoy socials. Our Padres, thank you uh, to Padre Cole for you and your team who are always there to respond to the question, excuse me, Padre, do you have a minute? Our advisory groups, Sentinel leaders, positive space ambassadors who represent the work going on to build an inclusive CAF that we all need and deserve. MFRC staff and volunteers who lead with the heart and provide the best support to military families in the RCAF. Thank you, Margaret, to you and your team, what you do for all of our families. Uh, to the ladies at the Annapolis Mess, okay, I say cheers. Uh, everybody knows your name when you go to the mess. You provided all of us with a safe place to end our week. And we've had some great conversations and I will truly miss those. Uh, to the PSP staff and Nicole and Philippa for leading the team. Thank you for the work and the fitness programming that ensures our members remain in top physical and mental shape. Uh, and to all the gym staff that have made sure that the protocols were followed and that people could go there and remain safe. Thank you very much. Uh, to Lisa, Jeanette and Edith who delivered so many courses and benefit that benefited our members, including respect in the CAF. I know that's uh, it's on hold right now as they improve the course, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you do with it in the future. Sarah White, thank you to the Aurora newspaper. Uh, you provided me a means to have a voice, not only throughout this wing, but throughout this community. Uh, I'd like to also talk uh, briefly about the 14 wing band, uh, Warrant Officer Jeff Campbell and Sergeant Calvin uh, Gallant uh, of the pipes and drums, the 14 wing pipes and drums. Uh, you have been an extraordinary group of, of individuals bringing together a great team that has not only been there through uh, parades and change of commands and everything else for the last three years, but you've also lifted our spirits, not just here, but across uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, and, and I'm indebted to that great, uh, great work that you've all done. Very, very proud of the 14 wing band and the 14 wing pipes and drums. And I couldn't go on and say about that without mentioning Captain Andrew Bruce. Uh, who was with the band for, for many, many years and of course continues to work diligently at supporting the 14 wing band, the pipes and drums. Uh, so thank you, Andrew, uh, for everything that you've done as well uh, for me and for the 14 wing uh, pipes and drums. Thank you to our honorary colonels who build bridges and local with local communities and dedicated hours of unpaid service and support of all of us. Uh, they stand proudly honored to wear the uniform. They remind me how, how precious this uniform really is. Uh, to Ward Officer Tim Fowler, who was my first uh, executive assistant, um, you know, or EA, AA, whatever you want to call it now, the person who is my savior. Uh, thank you so much for that. And for Sergeant Justin Cubis, uh, you know, Justin has been, uh, you know, so dedicated to not only supporting me and, and this entire headquarters, uh, but the wing in general. And so I want to present him with, uh, with a little something as a, an appreciation for the support that you've given me and all the work that you've done for the way. All right. There you go. Oh, lower. <laughs> so thank you, Justin, for everything you've done. Uh, I've said already that uh, as I move on to the division in Winnipeg, and you know that it's troublesome having right now because the person that was going to be my great assistant over there has taken a promotion and moved over. So they are scrambling around trying to find applicants uh, to, to work with me over there. Uh, and so I've said I would put you in my suitcase and take you over there. And we've already talked about you moving into my basement, which is still an option, by the way. But, uh, you know, I, I know that uh, that the incoming chief, so Chief Point Officer Jonathan Prue, is going to be ecstatic to have you as his assistant and, and to support him and everything he needs in this great wing. So thank you so much for again for all the support you've given to me over the last year. Thank you. Uh, 
I, you know, and, and as well, Donna Ramey, uh, Laura Blackmore, Captain Bergenhus, and Captain Archer, who have worked uh, so well here at, uh, at the headquarters. Uh, you supported me as well uh, through all the trips. When we were back traveling, you made my life so much easier through all of the paperwork, all of the claims processes, all the support. I will miss having our, our chief story hour, uh, you know, and so we'll have to do it virtually or on the phone in the future. I especially want to be uh, to say how appreciative I am of the command teams, of the chief warrant officers and the COs who have been uh, some of the best leadership teams in the country. Our officers who included me in their discussions and listened to my perspective, our chiefs who supported the, this wing throughout every challenge. Uh, two of our chiefs have already been selected for the non-commissioned member executive professional development program at RMC uh, in Kingston this summer. And then they, uh, some of them are going on as well for senior appointments in both the Canadian Armed Forces and the Royal Canadian Air Force, which, which is a real testament as to the uh, to the level of, uh, of uh, great leadership that they uh, possess. Others are moving on to new units this summer. Uh, some are staying here. And, and then we have Chief Warrant Officer Kevin Robarts, who will be retiring after 40 years of service with the Canadian Army and the Royal Canadian Air Force. So I want to say to you, Kevin, thank you so much for your support for me. Uh, and I know he's at home right now uh, with, his, with his girlfriend who's visiting in isolation. But uh, thank you so much for the work that you've done for this wing and, and for your country. Uh, I truly value your friendship. Now, speaking of talking about long time and service and stuff, um, I wanted to make a presentation, leave something to, to the wing. Um, so going back, my last trip uh, that I got to take uh, was uh, something that I wanted to do since I was a, a young guy, which was to go overseas and visit the World War I and World War II battlefields. And so in 2019, after I finished my master's degree, I said, uh, you know, I was waiting on the military to send me, you know, because I know sometimes they do that and uh, they, they never sent me. So I said, okay, enough is enough. I'm buying my ticket and off I went. Uh, and I got out there and I visited and toured around. So thank you to M.W. Emmons uh, for, for this, uh, for realizing my, my vision and goal for putting something together for the museum. Uh, I went to Normandy on the 75th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, and I collected sand from each and every beach. Uh, so from, uh, from Omaha and Utah and Juneau and Gold and Sword Beaches, there's sand from every single beach. And this is a map of Normandy, and I'm dedicating this to the uh, to the military, to Greenwood Aviation Museum, and uh, I know they'll be by to collect it a little bit later on uh, this morning. So thank you so much for, uh, for you know, to the museum for for making it a place of history. Uh, so thank you. A beautiful piece of work. And thank you, M. W. Emmons, for that. It's, it's fantastic, and I encourage people to go over and have a look at it. Uh, many of you have expressed your appreciation directly to me for the work that I've done at, the, at my time at Fort Wing. Uh, your comments and support have been greatly appreciated by me and my family. Uh, but I do believe that any uh, any measure of a wing chief one officer's success is truly on how the wing performs and not how the wing chief performs. And your performance and dedication and innovation has been noticed and emulated right across the RCF. And that is something that I am truly proud of. We get calls all the time asking us how you did this. Uh, we want to do uh, what 14 wing is doing. Uh, I've learned so much from the three years that I've been here. Uh, everyone has taught me something. And that's, I guess, the importance to remember is that you don't know where you're going to learn from, and you can learn from every single person. I've learned from aviators here on this wing that have inspired me with their enthusiasm uh, and, and to uh, remind me why I wear this uniform. Uh, to those amongst you that have shared your stories about discrimination, racism, and sexual misconduct, so I can better understand and reflect on my own biases, so I can better influence positive change, I say thank you very much. And I, I'm going to be working diligently hard uh, along with many other people to make sure that your future and your environment that you're working in is better than the one that you inherited. I've learned a lot from the person sitting next to me. Uh, there's no one that I've spent more time with than Colonel Cook. Uh, we are so fortunate uh, to have him as our wing commander. He's probably, you know, the wing commander of probably the most challenging time in 14 wing history. And no other time in the history of 14 wing has anybody had to deal with the challenges of a pandemic, of leading a wing uh, through uh, through all of this. He has dedicated himself to supporting this wing, ensuring mission capability while balancing the safety and health of all of us. He's never been afraid to take on tough and sometimes unpopular decisions. He's always included me. You always included me. You sought my advice. You valued my opinion. You allowed me uh, the freedom to lead and both trusted and supported my decisions. Um, similar to what you said earlier, we shared a lot. Our thoughts, our fears, our aspirations for this wing. Uh, we were comfortable enough with each other to vent 
uh, in, in, in private in our offices uh, and left each other up when we needed it. Um, in other words, you complete me. <laughs> and, and I don't miss your, your singing just, just a little bit. <laughs> now, all joking aside, uh, you know, it's been my, uh, my privilege uh, to be the Wing Chief Warrant Officer here as well as your Wing Chief Warrant Officer, sir. Uh, thank you to 14 Wing. Uh, thank you to you. Um, keep operating as one and I'm sure we will be in touch soon. So with that, I'll leave it to uh, farewell to Nova Scotia and uh, I'll be back. I won't stay. I'll let you have some flying this time. Thank you, everyone. Have a great, uh, great day. Enjoy your long weekend, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, operate as one. Farewell to Nova Scotia, you be bound, let your mouth and start.